Hello, hello, this is Leo and welcome to a new tutorial by Blau Films. Hello, hello, I am Eric Alcaraz, I am the director of photography in Blau Films. We're going to be exploring the different styles of lighting in several art movements and from different famous painters. And today we will be starting with looking at the Caravaggio lighting. We have set up this scene over here. We've got some house lights turned on. Everything is pretty basic and simple. We have these, uh, these skulls from Bill Ellis. We have some cloth from uh, Charlotte. Yeah, we're just gonna turn off these lights right now and then hopefully Eric can guide me through how to get the Caravaggio look. Brilliant, let's get on with it. We will be working with the interactive renderer over here. So right now I have the house lights turned off and the only thing I have turned on is a sky. Should I keep that or should I get rid of that as well? Uh, let's get keep that right now just for reference, just to see what are we doing. I would like you to pull up one of the references you have here on the right, yep. just to be able to know where to start and what are we doing. So there is this painting over here. I enjoy this painting simply because of how strong the contrast is and how sharp the light direction is yes yes and if you see from all the references you have the working Caravaggio, his work with light is quite consistent it appears to only be one source of light but as we kept on analyzing these paintings we realized that there are sometimes a little bit more than one light yeah or at least we need to to have one more light to be able to recreate this so one of the things that i can see right now is that he usually uses a almost a top light at least this one light on the left that is quite high yeah almost three quarters so i would suggest to start with um one of those lights in cinema for the is that going to be like a sunlight or are you thinking of having like an actual spherical light source or something i would suggest if you have in your library a 2k i think that'll be a good start when it comes to having something like a 2K, I would suggest creating a circular area light and then just bumping up the intensity. I'm moving this light over here. What kind of angle are you expecting? Let's start with something high, if possible. Um, I don't know how you calculate this on, in Cinema 4D. Can you see the green axes that you're having here? Yeah. That's basically the one that's showing you the light direction. Okay, so if possible, let's make it a little bit lower. The position or the angle? The position. About here? Yeah, let's start with that. Nice. As you can see in the viewport, it's already giving some light to the flowers over there. Right now, it's basically just shining onto the Spanish helmet. Yeah. So I could move it more towards this area. Okay, that's good. Maybe it's nice to quickly have a look at our camera settings before we start playing with the light. Yeah, yeah, that's something we forgot to mention. So right now we are on a 50 millimeters. Yeah, on a sensor size, it's a 35 millimeters. And our aperture, it's right now 16, Six. F16. Now, is there anything you would like to change on that? Let's go for an eight. Let's go for an eight. And shutter speed? Uh, go for a 50. Now, except for that, I've just given it some basic settings. I'm turning on the sharpening. I have turned on the depth of field with a bladed aperture of six blades. And I have a advanced bokeh FX put to a 1, 0 0.5 and negative 0 0.5 and isotropy, which is kind of giving you like that vertical bokeh. But because we're on a f-stop of 8, almost nothing will be out of focus. Brilliant. Yeah, that's something important when it comes to the recreation of the paintings or any sort of still life. Everything is in focus. So that's why we're trying to keep a close aperture yep. as much as we can. Absolutely. Of course, if you're having a close aperture, that means that you need to bring more light. So that's why I always like to start with a bright light and then start dimming it down if necessary. It's true because our light right now is already at an intensity of 250. Nice. Nice, it's a good start. So tell me, mate, what do you want to do with the light? Any color, any... I think I would like to warm the light a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. What's the temperature in the light right now? Uh, right now it's a color unit, but I can switch it to temperature and then you can control the temperature over here. That'll be great, yeah. Because uh, a lot of the temperature of the light that Caravaggio uses is more of a toxin. 
mm-hmm. light kind of a feel. He rarely used uh, cold lights on its paintings. Yeah. So I think if we can just go down to a tungsten temperature, something like 3200. 3200. Yeah, that's already matching the colors pretty nicely. It's interesting to see how the color temperature will affect the actual tones and hue of the colors itself. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so tell me, what do you think now? I think that the ambient light, we should change as well the temperature. Okay. Something it's it's good to analyze as well is that Caravaggio uses quite deep darks, but you still see some information in there, right? And that's why it's always useful to have a little bit of ambient light just to be able to see the blacks and then we can dim down the intensity until we get into the contrast ratio we're looking for. Now, when it comes to the ambient light, I believe you would be talking about the HDRI that we have right here. Yes. And let me just show you an actual image of what it looks like. So this is the HDRI that I'm using. Okay. So as you can see, the bottom section where it's in shadow, it's already a pretty cool shadow tone. Yeah. And that's what's giving us this cooler tone on our image over here. Now, what I could do is I could just basically put a grading note on top of this HDRI and make it warmer. Yeah, just a tiny bit warmer. At the end of the day, we want to have as well as much separation as we can. Um, But we still want to have this warm look. Something we can do as well is to uh, put another light. Instead of uh, having the HDR, we turn the the HDR off, Mm -hmm. and then we create another top light. How about that? Want to go for that? Yeah, probably, given that we were trying to recreate everything with lights here as much as possible. So have a look at what happens when I turn off the HDR. Nice. Everything goes very dark because we're not getting any bounce light. Yeah, I really like that. Yeah, let's try using a, a top light. Would that be a rounded light, a softbox? What are you looking for? I would say a softbox would do. How big are you thinking? Not too big. Maybe a softbox around um, one meter, probably. Cool. One by one. Yeah. I'm rotating it downwards. And have a look at this bottom corner over here. And you can tell me how high you want it to be. Uh, Get it higher, please. Now, for the viewers, um, I've mentioned this a few times in some of the tutorials, but remember, the bigger the light source, the softer the shadows, the smaller the light source, the harsher the shadows. We're complementing each other, (laughs) so I don't know anything about 4D, Cinema 4D. (laughs) So as you can see already in the result, it's giving a pretty nice result. It is indeed. Now, what I would like to do is to reduce the intensity of that top light. Yep. Now, do you want to play with the color as well? Yes, if we can match the color. 3200, right? Yes. And a intensity of, let's say, do you want to go half? Let's go half. Let's see how that looks. So in case you guys don't know, uh, yesterday when I set up most of this scene, I did a quick tryout to see if I knew how to do Caravaggio lighting, and I drastically failed. And... uh, (laughs) Let me pull up some examples on the screen. And now in just two lights, we're already getting closer to the result we're after. I think that's looking quite good. Yeah, pretty good, right? Um, Something that I'm missing as well is to have um, the light for the background. Mm -hmm. Because there are some textures in in there that are worth exploring. And I think it would add a lot of uh, color contrast because the the drapes uh, have a very nice deep red quite close to the color of the reference. So I think it's important now to add a little bit of light there. Let me quickly rename this light. So the first one, how would we call that one? That's our uh, 2K key light? Yes, that's our key light. Then we have a top light. And the third one would be the background light. Now, how are we going to do this background light? I would say let's bring another light, just just like the, the key light you have. Okay. But this one, let's make it a 1K. Maybe you can make it a 13 centimeters, probably. Where do you want to position this? Let's take it more to the left. To the Camera left. left. Yes, exactly. And almost if you want to go, as if you wanted to go round the table. Or do you want to go round from the bottom side or round from the top side? From the top side. Ah, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Otherwise, you would be getting some light interference with the skull on the foreground. Exactly. 
exactly. So what we want is to isolate the light uh, so there would be like literally no light spilling to the table. Yep. And do you want to shine that right at the background? Yes, please. Cool. Now this light is pretty weak. I'm not seeing too much of a impact on the background. Okay, then let's make it stronger. Then let's match the same uh, intensity as the 2K. Yeah, we're getting some more out of it now. Mm -hmm. But it's still too weak? Well, I don't know. Have a look here at the... Yeah, I think we're going to need a little bit more. So do you want to just have a stronger light? We could double this to 500. Yep, have let's make it... Yep, let's make it harder, please. So, so there is this directionality function over here. And mm -hmm. it's basically... Um, think of it as like the flags around your light. So you could like direction your light to be more more of a spotlight than a flood light. Is that what yeah, you call right. it? Yeah, yeah. Right now you're saying it's flooded? Right now it's flooded. Okay, let's make it spot. Let's start with that. I mean, I don't know how the percentages work in Cinema 4D, but let's start with a 50% spot. Yep. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> there you go. Now it makes sense. I was like, wow, we're, we're adding too much intensity and nothing seems to, yep. to be affecting the background. Yeah, so now you're 50% uh, now you're 50 spotting the light. Okay, brilliant. Now, something I would like to do is to create this line with the light, you know, to make it really, really thin, as if it was coming through a window hole. Okay, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So just put like two flags in front of it? Yeah, well, in reality, what you would do would be to... Uh, have the cutters of the of the Fresnel. Yep. Get the cutters, the top one and the bottom one, and just really, really close them. The top one and the bottom one. So you have a yeah. horizontal line. Exactly. So in Cinema 4D, what you would go for is you would create a plane, just drag it right in front of your background light. What we're going to do here is I'm going to make this editable up here. And I'm going to go to the polygon selection mode. And I'm just really going to select two loops in the middle. So hit U and L to make a loop cut. Or, sorry, to make a loop selection. Select like three or four of them. And then we'll hit backspace. And now I am using this material over here, which is just simply a uh, black diffuse material with no reflection or anything. And that's going to work as our flag or let's say our negative fill in this case. And we're just going to be blocking out as much of that light as we can. I'm really liking it. It's, it's very weird to work like this, but it's very <laughs> interesting. Absolutely. I think this, this kind of exercises will help us a lot to uh, be able to work more, um, how would I say it, more friendly when it comes to uh, CGI shots on our music videos. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think so too. Like it's, it, it's often that we work on projects together, but you know, sometimes the communication is one of the most complicated aspects of the whole process. Yeah. Okay, now we have basically completely closed it down. As you can see in the preview, we're not actually seeing much of that light showing up anymore but I feel like we might have to up the directionality to be able to see um, s some kind of a streak. Yeah, yeah. Something you can do is to play around with the height. It, yeah, because it might be that we're just so far away from our cloth that whatever is shining through this slit is not actually registering as a thin line anymore. Yeah, yeah, it's already quite flooded, so... Yeah, I would say let's start with that. Let's bring it as close as you can. Maybe angle it down slightly more or put it higher. What's the angle? Can I see like on the arrows where it's supposed Yeah, supposedly it's this uh, blue arrow that you're seeing over here. And the yeah. top of the cloth is this line with the uh, with this rectangular square. Hmm, that's strange. Maybe if you pan right a little bit. So the cloth on the top left corner, the red and the green cloth, is already getting pretty much of a nice plasticity. And I'm 
quickly going to do a few minor changes here. So I'm putting the highlight compression to 1.2. And where shall we take the f-stop? Let's let's double the f-stop. So if we were on an 8, let's go for a 16. Mm -hmm. Yep, the image is getting pretty dark, as you can see. Yeah. So we'll have to double the light. Double the light. Damn. We are doubling the softbox. And we are doubling the key light. Yeah, we're essentially getting the same image now. Yeah, that is something worth to to add to all the cinematographers out there. The more light you bring, the sharper the image will get. So every time you're exposing, try to expose as far on the right as you can. And then in post-production, you can bring it down to your actual look. So that will give you no funny noise in the darks. But on the contrary, you're going to have the sharpest and the cleanest darks. I think that's very interesting. That's really a, a, a digital filmmaking tip, right? It is. It is because um, exposing on the shoulder, that's where you're getting the best out of the sensor as opposed to exposing on the toes of the curve. Yep. For those who don't know, the toes of the curve means when the curve starts moving at the bottom section, the bottom left corner, and the uh, shoulder is on the right top where it starts moving back into the S shape. Now I'm quickly going to enable the bloom and glare, putting the bloom to two, size 25, and a streak count of four, a color shift of 0 0.8. And that should be it. Let's see if that does anything. Yeah, it's giving a bit of a bloom, as you can see, on the helmet on the left corner. Yeah. Now I will take it down a little bit. I'm putting the intensity to 1. And we'll have it in the background while we can work on something else. So I think we need to work on that background. We need to get that light in place. So I would say let's remove completely the flags. Let's just open the whole thing. And then we can start working right on the angle. A good way to... To work around that is to make the light quite spotted, mm -hmm. make it hit on the right place you want it, and then you can start flooding everything out. I've turned off the flags right now. As you can mm -hmm. see, much more light has already entered the scene. 100% spotted. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. There, there you go. That's why it wasn't hitting. So I would say let's try to move it as in as center as possible. Something that I can see now it didn't work with the pan because it went down. So I think you need to tilt up the light tilt up the, the light. light. Yeah, just tilt up Now it's there. <laughs> there you go. There you go. That was the problem now Try to pan right a little bit more just so it can be just right in the back of that of the flowers Now it's essentially behind the flowers that's brilliant. Okay, now let's start flooding. So let's take it to like 50% again. Let's go for a 70% please. 70%. Oh, look at that. I think we need, yeah, definitely we need more. Let's even go for a 40. Yep. That's just about right. And now you can bring the flags. Now the flags have pretty much darkened almost everything down. Yeah, you'll have to... Um, spread them apart and as well if you can bring them further from the light that will be great okay so I'm quickly adding a cinema for the compositing tag and I'm making it invisible to the camera how close are, how close are the flags from the background about two meters two or three meters try to bring them closer to the background as much as you can just the flags yes oh look at that there you go there you go that was a problem yeah, the thing is that if you want to create sharper shadows, you need to be as close as you want to the subject where you want to create this, uh, the shadows. Yeah. The further you are, the bigger the shadow. And that's when you don't get this sharp line we were trying to look for. It's just complicated to see it here in the Cinema 4D because you don't know the actual... Distances to anything. Exactly. But there you go. That's more of a desired look. Something else I would like to add once that we finish the background is to have a side flag just so we know that there is no light spilling to the table. 
because we're controlling that with separate lights. So that would be something that just would just be in between the background and the foreground. Exactly, exactly. Just to have a side light and we block the lit, any light. Cool, so how do you feel about this now? I really like it. I really like it. With three lights, we are creating interesting shapes, interesting shadows, and that's something I'd like to do a lot on, on the projects I work on. It's not only about bringing a lot of lights, but it's more how would you shape them. I heard that, um, uh, what's his name? Janusz Kaminski, the DP who works with Spielberg, Yeah. that he likes to bring a whole truck full of lights. Yes, he does. Well, if you have the budget to <laughs> have any light on your disposal, yeah. I would do that as well. <laughs> yep. Then just go for it. Exactly. Cool. Now, what I'm noticing is that this flag, I've brought it pretty close to the background, but it's excluding the, the exactly. uh, ones on the yeah. other side. I can give you a duplicate of the flag and move that exactly. one to the front. Yeah, if you can duplicate those. So now it's looking much better. Nevertheless, there is still a bit of some light that is not quite hitting the, the left side of the background. Where the cross is or where the fabric is? Where the fabric is. So you, you still have like a little bit of a very smooth shadow there. So I think if you can, let's do that again. Let's get the flags as close as you can to that side to be able to have that. There you go. Yeah, we're, we're trying to create as much separation as we can from the background to the foreground and all the elements in between. Yep. Um, so that kind of style and shadow place i think they're they're doing its job um let's see something else i'm missing a little bit it's a bit of detail on the shadows of the right of the foreground of the objects there you go now i'm missing a little bit of that but i don't want to bring more lights because you know that'll be just excessive yeah so what i would do is to add a bit of a bounce okay, okay. we're starting with a bounce so how are we going to do that? What kind of a bounce are you looking for? Um, not a big one. Let's try a, let's try a two by two. Two by two? Yeah. And is that going to be white, silver or gold? Uh, okay, wow, you have the option. Um, <laughs> let's try a gold one. Let's put it just right, you know, where the table is rowing the 90 degrees. That's where I would put it. It has to be like just right in the corner of the table. Ah, okay, somewhere like here. Yes, somewhere like there. And what yeah. is it that you're trying to do with this? I'm trying just to give a little bit of feel to the to the darks on that side. And we're using just, a gold material. Yeah, a gold material. And let's see if it's too intense on the same direction, we just need to pull it back. It's actually not very intense. It is not very intense, right? It's just giving a little bit of a bounce, but it's probably just the, the angle, because I feel like if we slightly angle it upwards, we're, okay, yeah. we're going to be upwards. able to catch some of that softbox light. Mm -hmm. Bring it upwards. The idea here is just to have a feel on the right side of the image and not to affect the other, because the intensity on the, on the other side is, is quite all right. Yeah. Now, it's not giving off too much light, but it is giving us that golden reflection on the right side. That's good. That's good. I like to have like very uh, dim feel light in there, just to add a little bit of something. Yep. But we need to make sure that our contrast ratio is consistent throughout the whole image. Yes. Now, it's funny because when you look at a Caravaggio painting at first glance, it basically just looks like he put the contrast to 100 and called it a day. <laughs> but then when you really start looking at it, it's, it's, it's actually not that contrasty in the values themselves. No, it's not. It's not. I mean, he has like quite, quite of a big contrast ratio. Um, but if, if you go, for example, to the reference you have on top, and you get closer to the skull. Now, something you can see is that um, there's uh, you can still see in the darkest areas, and there's a bit of a backlight in there. Yep. Yeah, so there's even like a bounce getting back to the dark side of the face. And of course, any kind of backlight will always add more contrast. 
Okay, so we increased the intensity of the foreground and now we have to increase the intensity of the background? Yes, yes, because we, we closed the aperture. 2,500? Yes, please. Okay, well, that's looking good to me. Yeah, pretty much, right? Yeah. Now, now it's the time where I think we have our lights in the right position. Um, I think everything's looking good. It's looking nice. But I think now it's uh, it's a time to work with subtleties. Mm -hmm. Yep. And for that, I would really need to see a, a good preview just to know exactly where am I missing something. Hello, everybody. We're back. We took a two day break from this project, but for you, this is just going to be like a split second. Let's have a look at the most recent version we got up till now, and then we'll discuss how to finish this off. Cool. Eric, word is on you. Yeah, so, I mean, looking at this uh, render, some of the things that we're noticing is that, um, first of all, we have a lot of background. Uh, we reveal too much of the background. That's something we would like to avoid. We want to be a little bit more um, mysterious with it. So something we'll have to do is to rearrange a little bit the flag positions just to be able to see the textures. On the other hand as well, I would like to flag the key light. So we're only able to see not the whole table, but just a little part of it. I think that would give more depth and a bit more mystery to the shot itself. Yep, nice. So essentially removing this front section where we're seeing the uh, the corner of the table. Yes. Okay. Correct. Okay. Correct. Bes besides that, I think the contrast we managed to get is quite well, and and we're getting a nice texture out of the objects. Yeah. Um, okay. So how about if we start uh, flagging out the key light? Okay. So if possible, let's turn off the the background light to be able to just focus on that. Yeah, absolutely. All right, there you go. Background light is turned off, and this is what we get. Brilliant, okay. So how about if we start putting a flag as close as we can to the to the table to try to flag the front yep. side of it. That's actually one thing that I learned in this process, that if you want to flag something, you should put the flag close to the object you want to flag, as opposed to putting it close to the light source. Correct. I've been doing it wrong all my life. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, I think that's one of the good things about making these kind of uh, experiments and exercises. You, you still can learn a lot. Yeah. <clears throat> and with the whole pandemic thing. <laughs> Absolutely. You can just do it yourself. You don't need like a crew of two or three people to do it. Yeah. yeah. Even though I do really miss, you know, going out and shooting with people. Oh, my. Every day. Every day. <laughs> but we're slowly getting there. Slowly. All right. I've made a big flag. I've put it in position. It's close to the table, but now, as you can see, it's just ginormous. Um, right now, mm. it's four by four meters. How big do you want it? Mm. I think the size should be um, one by one. One by one. And then just try to get it as lower to the camera. So should, as you can see in the top left corner, you can see that I've angled the flag the same way that the light is angled. Do you want the flag to be straight or what do you want to do with it? Yeah, yeah, let's get it uh, straight. Just kind of the same position. We have the other flags. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, let's just put it in position and let's try to look for the for the fact. So I think it has to be in front of the 2K that we have there. So I, I would say that maybe a, a good way to figure it out the, the position is to block the light completely. And from there, we start, we start to bring the flag down. Now from bring it, bring it as close to the table as you can. Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah, so we can get like a very defined shadow. Yep. So as close to it as we can, and then you start bringing it down. Down. 
Ah, so we start introducing light from the top. Oh, and then we get the shadow at the bottom. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. Okay, I understand. Uh, let's see a little bit more of the preview. Mm -hmm. But I think we're getting very close. Okay, yeah, I think that's that's it. Mm -hmm. We got there. Nice. We got there. Now, something I'm looking at is that this is the fact that just all the background is completely dark. It's it's giving us more of a Caravaggio look as opposed to what we had before on, with the background light. Mm -hmm. Shall I turn on the background light? Yes, please. I do think there are some elements in the background that make the shot better but i do as well agree with what you said in the beginning that we are giving off too much information in the background right now so we need to keep on experimenting with the flags um the first thing i would do is to bring the flags lower because i can see the top end of the curtains and that's something i i wouldn't like to have yeah so i'm lowering the flags I think you lowered them a little bit too much. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see there. Let's see there. And that's looking good. Let's see a bit more of the preview. Yep. Those are the first ones, right? <laughs> yeah, those are the first ones. That's crazy, man. Yeah, well, we're, we're coming a long way from that. Absolutely. So what would you like to do? For, for me, I think it's... All right because you know it, it has a little bit of light so we can see what's that there is something in the background mm -hmm. but um i mean carvalho i think is even more minimalistic with with his backgrounds like there are almost no backgrounds in in his paintings yeah here is definitely nothing completely dark but i mean it's a good way to start thinking on how to do that kind of clear obscure lighting like what are the things you need to consider and even though your set is much bigger than what caravaggio used to paint i think it's a it's very important to be conscious that always in this kind of lighting it has to be from only one side at least your key and if you need to push a little bit your blacks then you give it a little bit of top light i feel like that's one of the most impressive things during this process is that once we manage to work a little bit of more effort into placing that key light and giving it a correct color temperature of what was it like 3200 kelvin and then on yes. top of that, adding that top light to create a bit of a rim, that basically already did the entire job. Yeah, exactly. Now, I have a question. The drape that is on the right-hand side, yep. uh, does that one has a separate flag? Yes. How about if we try to get rid of the top end as well? Okay. There you go. Yeah. I think one of the advices as well I can give is to, you know, you have on your mind an idea and just try to do everything but as well be uh, be very observing what are the flags doing and what is the effect that you have on light because you know that's gonna guide you through uh, even more interesting path so yeah i would say just be very observing when you're moving around your lights and your flags especially and like in cg is it's a pretty easy process you know we can just pull up these lights and pull up some flags and do it but actually for shooting this in live action it's not that complicated either right uh no no actually it's uh it's interesting as long as you have a couple of systems a couple of flags you can get very interesting effects something i'm noticing as well is that <clears throat> maybe a little bit of the right side of the table it's a uh, it's a bit dark but i think we can we can fix that by um, maybe moving the top light a little bit more as well to the right so we can give a little bit of push on that side because the key is already giving a, a lot of information to the left side absolutely but the right hand side it's a little bit dark so if i just move the one by one meter softbox a little bit further to the right yeah yeah there you go i think we're gonna get more information in there yeah maybe a tiny bit more yeah okay yeah i think we are in a good place i would say this could be our final frame oh my god what i would like to do <laughs> what i would like to do is to probably um export a, a preview with a proper render to be able to see it assess that but um i think we're there nice excellent it was uh, a pleasure and very fun to work 
like this is this is my first cinema for the recreation on something but uh, <laughs> i think it's very interesting and as well to all of the cinematographers out there to know that they can use these tools and to experiment with these tools prior to a shoot oh yes absolutely yeah because sometimes you don't have enough budget to do all the tests and stuff and you know you can feel quite pressure uh to go on set without really trying what you wanted and this is a very nice way cheap way to start experimenting prior to to your shoots yeah absolutely and then after this video be sure to subscribe to our channel because we will be making some more of these um eric was talking about rembrandt yeah i feel like the world of painters is an infinite supply of knowledge for us to experiment with exactly i'm very excited for the next episode on this series nice nice well thank you very much eric i'll let you go and uh Thanks a lot. Laters. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.